I just want to encourage you guys, um, when you study the Bible verse by verse, you can't skip around, you can't do topical messages where you don't deal with, you got to deal with each verse, and that's what we do. That's how God wants the Bible taught and read. So that's what we do. Uh, let's get into our study today in the book of 1 Corinthians. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And today's study is called The Preaching of the Cross. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. <clears throat> we're continuing our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of 1 Corinthians. We began uh, the, the study in the book of Romans. We finished that up a few weeks back. Now we're in our study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, this is how the Apostle Paul says that God desires for the believer today to grow in their edification. So now we're in the book of 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. <clears throat> we left off in about verse 14. Um, we might have touched on verse 14, so we'll pick it up right here. Just to get the, just to get the uh, flow of it, look at verse 12. Paul says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanas, besides I know, what, I know not whether I baptized any other. Last verse, here we go. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time this morning. As we look into the word of your grace, this mystery of Christ, as laid out by the Apostle Paul, may you give us great insight and understanding and, and, and wisdom, and, and may it abound uh, to our glory and to yours, Father, for edification and to your glory throughout all ages, world without end. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word with those of like precious faith this morning. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Last time we saw that there was this contention. And what we saw that the contentions that were in the Corinthian churches were based upon men who were not rightly dividing God's word. They were bringing in other doctrines contrary to Paul's gospel of grace. And we saw that in Romans chapter number 16. Go back a, a verse, a, a page, if you will. Romans chapter 16. Look with me at verse 17. <clears throat> Paul already talked about these divisive doctrines. He says in verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them, identify, point out, which cause divisions. So these guys cause the divisions, the denominations. And offenses, they offend against God's grace. He says, contrary to the doctrine which he had learned and avoid them. And the doctrine that the Romans learned was Paul's doctrine. He's the apostle of, to us Gentiles, and he wrote the book of Romans. So any doctrines that come along, any wind of doctrine, we're going to see in Ephesians 4, that comes along, that appalls what the Apostle Paul writes, now it's recorded in Romans through Philemon, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you're going to cause divisions, that's why there's all these different denominations out there, and offenses, there's an offense against the truth of Almighty God, and those people we're going to see in chapter 3, those men who do that, if they're saved, now we've got lost men doing it too, they're going to lose reward at the judgment seat of Christ, but we'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 3. So go back to chapter number 1 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. He says here in verse number 12. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul. Now we saw that. When it says I am of Paul, that, that they were a follower of the Apostle Paul. And him and, and, and saying that no other person can give us the truth besides Paul. Now when I say Paul, they mean Paul the man. They, were, they, they, they did not recognize that someone like Apollos or any other member of the body of Christ who was to teach and preach, as long as they're giving Paul's doctrine out, they can listen to them. Go to uh, chapter number 3 again of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 3. Notice here that when you walk as men, notice in verse 4, 1 Corinthians 3, 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am Apollos. Now he's talking about the men. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? So he's talking about the man. And who is Apollos? You know, Apollos from Acts 18 there. But what? Ministers 
by whom ye believed, as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted a Paul's water, but who gave the increase? God gave the increase. And so what Paul is saying is, look at men as what God wants you to look at, as ministers of God's word. Don't, be, don't make the man the issue. Make him as a minister in what he's teaching and preaching the issue. Now, there are times when Paul says to follow him. But what he means is follow him as the apostle of us Gentiles. Follow his office. Go back to Romans chapter 11. Let me show you that. Romans 11. You're going to be accused when you share this message of worshiping Paul. Right. You're going to be accused of making too much of Paul or a big deal of Paul. Well, quite frankly, in my study of the Pauline epistles for 18, 19 years, we don't make enough of his office. The body of Christ wouldn't be in the shambles that it's in if people did do what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians, speak the same thing, and that's his doctrine. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, that's all the nations, inasmuch as I am the apostle, that's a sent one, of the Gentiles, I magnify now not myself, but his what? His oh. office. And Paul's office was his commissioning was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's glory. You remember that we're going to see even those people say, well, I am of Christ. You guys worship Paul, I worship Jesus. You guys follow Paul, but I follow Jesus. And what they mean is Jesus' earthly ministry. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, we don't know any man after the flesh. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, during his earthly ministry, yet henceforth now know him no more. And the people who say they follow Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are lying. Because any test of the scriptures would see that they don't offer sacrifices that Moses commanded, as Christ did. They don't, they don't keep the commandments of the law for eternal life. See, all the things that Jesus said during his earthly ministry, you can't keep today. Because it's a past dispensation. When you rightly divide the word of truth, God deals with mankind under the dispensation of grace. We're not under the law, we're under grace. Romans 6, 14. So notice here, go back to 1 Corinthians. He says, I am a Paul, I am a Paul. So evidently, by whom he believed, he said over there, these, he mentions Paul, Apollo, Stephen, Christ. Uh, these were the people who had uh, uh, the, the, uh, like contact with these folks. And what, what in, in that culture, you would have a, a discipleship. You know, you would, you would be a follower of someone. Paul was of Gamaliel when he was Saul of Tarsus. He was a follower, a, a, a student of Gamaliel. And what Paul is wants to get you, don't look at the outward flesh. Don't be followers of men. Be followers of the minister who's preaching the right doctrine. Notice what he says here in verse number 13. Is Christ divided? And we saw that the body of Christ is to be one body, not divided. Was Paul crucified for you? Paul the, apostle, Paul the man is not the issue. The Lord Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, and what he did at Calvary, that's the issue. It's called the preaching of the cross. Notice it says here in verse 13, Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Now, in Paul's early ministry, he dealt with the Jew first and then also the Gentile. Evidently, as Paul went through Corinth, let me put our map up here. And if you have a map in your Bible, you can follow that. You probably won't be able to see this too well on the video. Maybe you guys can. Remember, we saw in Romans, Paul was in the areas of Macedonia and Achaia, over here in Europe. And here is Corinth. Evidently, when Paul went into the uh, uh, Corinth there in, in Acts uh, 18, he went into the synagogues. We went over that. You can read that in Acts 18. What I believe is that the ones that Paul is talking about water baptizing, that's what he's talking about water baptizing, has to do with the Jews who were at Corinth, who believed. I don't have any evidence from Scripture that Paul actually water baptized a Gentile. The Jews understood water baptism to be a cleansing ceremony that God gave to the Jewish people. Okay, John's baptism, but even before, all the way back to Exodus 29, kingdom of priests and holy nation, so they would get water baptized, cleansed. And evidently, the ones that Paul baptized, Crispus and Gaius, if you look with me at verse number 14, look at verse 14. I thank God. Now, now that, don't let that slip. We use that term kind of, uh, you know, we don't, put, we don't put a lot of emphasis when we say, well, I thank God. 
When Paul says, I thank God, he's saying, thank you, Lord, that I did not baptize more than just these guys. And he mentions one more household. Because Paul's going to understand that they're so carnal that they would were, they were end up saying blasphemous that Paul baptized people in his own name. Like, be baptized in the name of Paul. Right. He didn't want it to be any problem. He did want to baptize, but it was obviously in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've was seen Crispus that. of Gaius Jews? They were Jews, yes. yes. <laughs> Remember we saw Crispus in our study in the book of Romans. He, uh, Crispus, we saw Crispus in, in the book of Acts. He was one of those Jews who, who um, were there in Acts 18 from the synagogue. And Gaius was the host of Paul. Paul wrote the book of Romans from Corinth. And the person he stayed with while he was in Corinth was gay. So these men were Jews, yes. Okay? So verse number 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest, I mean, he, he, he understood that they were so carnal, that the, the saints there, lest any should say that I had baptized how? In my own name. He baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ, no doubt. And I baptized what I'm seeing here, Paul is so blasé about water baptism. He's, he's trying to recall years ago when he was at Corinth. He's trying to recall, I, he writes this book from Ephesus, by the way. He's over here in Ephesus. He's trying to recall, who did I baptize? Man, I'm so glad I didn't baptize about him. Okay, I know Christmas. By the way, Christmas and Gaius, they were the, some of the first converts there. He says, okay, I know I did them. Anybody else? Verse 15, less... Oh, verse 16. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Stephanus. Yes, now Stephanus, like Stephen. Let me show you this. Stephanus is a Jew. His household, it's, 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 it's like this name, Stephen here. Stephen was a Jew who was stoned when Saul was saved. My point is, he's trying to recall. He has a very blase attitude about it. As years went on, and Christ never, did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ never commanded the Apostle Paul to water baptize anybody? He never even mentioned it in his gospel. Now that's important because we're going to look at the gospel that Peter and the twelve, that the Lord Jesus and John the Baptist preached, and all of their preaching and teaching of a gospel included water baptism, but not Paul. <laughs> Let's keep going right here, verse 16. And I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Paul is trying to recall. He, can't, he, he, he hasn't even thought about water baptism for years, over a decade. Why? Verse 17. <clears throat> Here's the point. Further explanation. For Christ sent me. There's what it means to be an apostle. Sent one. Not to what? Yeah. Baptize, but contrary. To preach the gospel. Now, what gospel is that? Grace God. Gospel of grace God. Go with me to Acts chapter 20. Go to Acts chapter 20 because I want you to see and hear the apostle and through, the, through the pen of, 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 of his, one of his favorite uh, best friends and companions, the beloved physician Luke, who wrote the book of Acts. When you want to know which gospel Paul preached, because there's so much confusion in denominations about the gospel, you hear people talk about on radio and television the gospel. And I can bet 99.9% .9 of the time they're talking about the gospel of the kingdom from the gospels of the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll show you that. It's all we ever knew. <clears throat> it's all we ever knew. Until you focus on the ministry of the right. Apostle Paul. Right. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 24. <clears throat> but none of these things move me, these afflictions and so forth, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Paul was willing to die for the Lord. So that... <clears throat> I may finish my course with joy. Remember in 2 Timothy 4, I finished my course. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, uh, the Lord Jesus, who gave Paul his ministry, the Lord Jesus from heaven's glory, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And if you want to know what that gospel of grace, <clears throat> in our dispensation of grace, grace has to do with God's riches at Christ's expense. You can't, can't get anything better than that. His expense. It has to do with unmerited favor. God gives you favor and you haven't merited undeserved kindness. 
He's kind to you and you don't deserve it. He's kind to me and we don't deserve it. That's what grace is. And here's the biggest thing about grace. No works required. That's different than God, how God dealt with the nation of Israel. No works are required. Ephesians 2, what do we see in our study? For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? Free gift. Boast. That's right. It's the gift, the free gift. <clears throat> no works. That's what God's grace, that's how he deals with man today. That's how he saves a person today. When you trust the shed blood of Jesus Christ and that alone, God saves you that moment forever. You know, because of the different denominations, the different uh, not rightly dividing preachers, they confuse themselves and others about whether they have eternal security or whether they, did I really get saved? Did I not? Look at my life. It's not, I'm not living like the Lord should, but maybe I'm not saved. Maybe you're not saved, right? It's all confusion. You need to come to the Apostle Paul and rest in God's unchanging grace. It's the gospel, the grace of God. Now, that wasn't the case in time past. Go back to Matthew chapter 3. Let's go through some of these verses in the gospels that people don't rightly divide, and they confuse folks. I remember my wife, Krista. She understood growing up about grace to faith salvation. But she was stuck by a brother in the Lord before she met me, who brought a passage from Mark 16. I'm going to show you that passage. Now, once I taught her how to rightly divide, she understands how to do it. I taught that guy how to rightly divide it, too. The guy who was confusing her. He was confused, confused my wife, and then I taught both of them because I showed him how to rightly divide these issues. When it comes to baptism, there are more than one baptism in Scripture. There are multiple baptisms. Some say up to 12, if you, depending on how you break them out. But it's more than one. Look at, John, look at Matthew 3, Matthew 3, verse uh, 11. This is John the Baptist speaking to Israel. Here's, here's three baptisms in one verse. Matthew 3, 11. I indeed baptize you, that's Israel, with what? Water unto repentance. There's John the Baptist's ministry to, to call out the, the nation of believers on the Messiah, to, to be the forerunner. And he, 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 he show, you show your faith and your repentance by submitting to John's water baptism, if you were a Jew in that day. I indeed baptize you with water, verse 11. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Who is that? That's the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. So I can't even get down there. I'm not even worthy to mess with his feet here. He shall baptize you with the what? Holy, Holy Ghost and with fire. So here now the Messiah shows up. He'll baptize Israel with the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ sent the Holy Ghost down first from his apostles. Then as people were added to the, to the Kingdom Church, the Messianic Church in the book of Acts, 3,000, 5,000. The, the apostles will lay hands on them after water baptizing them. Lay hands, and here comes the Spirit of God. They speak with other tongues. That, that's what it was. Water baptism, believe on Jesus as your Messiah. What, same thing, believe on Jesus as your Messiah, be water baptized. Lay hands on them from an apostle. Spirit of God comes down, they speak with tongues. They're in the little flock, okay? That was the, the way it went until a moment in time in the book of Acts. Let's look at, uh, oh, the baptism of fire. You didn't want that one. Let me close this chart here. <laughs> because I've been in a denominational system, not long, but I hear about them too, where they talk about, oh, we want the Holy Ghost fire. You don't want the Holy Ghost fire. The Holy Ghost fire wasn't a good thing. Fire represents judgment and wrath in a prophetic program. The day of the Lord, the great and noble, great and terrible day of the Lord's wrath is a day like fire, it says. What Jesus Christ would do is, if you trusted him in that, in that, as a Jew, in that day, he would send down the Holy Spirit and all the ghosts on you. Baptism means identification. I didn't tell you that. That's what that word means. Uh, I, to be totally identified. So it fits. Identification. We'll talk more about that with our, with our uh, Romans 6 baptism. Okay, So to be identified with the little flock, you had to submit to water baptism in that day. It was a cleansing it's to clean you from your sins. Okay, All right. But one day, if you didn't, as a Jew, submit to the water baptism of, of John or of, of the apostles and trust in Jesus, he would baptize you with fire. That fire represents being identified with the rebellious uh, uh, people of Israel. 
the, the people who didn't trust Jesus Christ. That's the day of the Lord. And so what I want you to see that in one verse, Matthew 3.11, there's three different baptisms. Go with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 7. Go over to Luke chapter 7, if you will. I'm just going to go through some of these verses. We always have some new folks, maybe just new to them. Some of you guys are sort of freshmen. Others, they may be new to it. They're watching on YouTube or something. Luke chapter 7, look at verse 29. You'll be just like the brother I told you two years ago. He, you thought I was crazy saying there's no water baptism for today. Well, you, you're in the same position he was. There's a lot of religious bondage, corruption in your mind. You study this out. You see that the Apostle Paul was never commanded to water baptize by our Lord Jesus. Paul never in 13 epistles, Romans through Philemon, show me one verse where Paul ever told a believer to, to water baptize. There's not a single verse in all of Romans through Philemon, almost half that New Testament, as it were, 13 to 27, where Paul ever commands us to water baptize. Just fine, you won't. It's not there. I've asked preachers that back in the past few years. Show me one verse where Paul says, Hey, water baptize. Here's how to do it. I can show you verses where he says, don't do it. Christ didn't send me to baptize. They're not one. Why wouldn't it be one verse? I'm going to take verses all through the Gospels and Acts where water baptism is, is, is told. They're told to water baptize. We saw John. Look at, look at Luke chapter 7, verse 29. you got to let the scriptures tell you this. Notice in verse number 29. And all the people that heard him, speaking of John, and the publicans justify who? God. God. They say, God, you're right. Being baptized with the baptism of who? John. John. Read the next verse. But the Pharisees, these were the religious leaders of Israel, apostate unbelieving. The Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being what? No. Not baptized of him. So in Israel, if you were baptized, you were justifying God. If you were not were baptized with John's baptism, you were rejecting the counsel of God. And that, that you would be under the fire. See, you're going to be baptized with John's baptism. If you baptize with John's baptism, you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost later. Look back. If you reject God's counsel and not be baptized with John's baptism, you're going to get the fire out there. Keep going. Look at Acts chapter 2. This is the most famous passage. I remember I remember years ago asking a guy who's nice and religious about a job I was at. And, and you know, I said, uh, so you, you go to church, huh? Yeah. I said, what does your church teach for salvation? That guy pulled that little, I give him credit, he did have a little New Testament. He had it all ready. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. But you know, I had to show him some things. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter is speaking to Israel, right? Notice it says in verse 38. Oh, oh, look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of who? In Israel know. We're still at a time pre-dispensation of grace where God is dealing with the nation of Israel. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. There's the religious, the political rule and the religious rule. Here we go, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were what? Pricked in their heart. They were convicted. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now what's Peter's response? Is it like the apostle Paul when the Philippian jailer says, he says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? Notice what Peter says here. And then Peter answered, said unto them, Repent, means turn, turn from your wickedness for, for re repent of crucifying your Messiah, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What do we learn about remission of sins? That wasn't total forgiveness of sins. Just like you can have cancer and it goes into remission, it can come back. John chapter 20, he says, Whosoever sins ye remit, speak Christ to the apostles, they are remitted. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. The, the twelve had the ability to, forget, to, to remit sins and then put it right back on. 
That's what Peter did to a man named Simon the Sorcerer in Acts 8. That's what Peter did to a couple in Acts 5 named Ananias and Sapphira. God took this issue of water baptism with these Jews very serious. Notice he says, be baptized every one of you for the remission of sins, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now, here's the problem. By the time you get past the Apostle Paul in Acts 9, you come to Peter, who's, who's confused and confounded, even frustrated that God has sent him to a Gentile. What are you sending me to a Gentile for? The Great Commission is not a commission. We're, we're to have, we're to go out to all the world after the Lord returns. Matthew 10, 23, you would not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Peter and those guys never looked to go to the Gentiles until the return of Jesus Christ. That's Matthew 10, 23. People forget that verse. The, they weren't fulfilling the Great Commission in the book of Acts. At least not the parts of the Gentiles yet. Those, <clears throat> those apostles understood that Jesus Christ told them, I will come back. You know, a lot of people haven't seen that. Hold your hand here. Go to Matthew 10, 23. <laughs> because, I mean, no wonder people think I'm crazy because they haven't read the scriptures. That's right. I'm crazy enough to believe what I read. <laughs> See, all God is looking for, I was talking to Brother Matt down in Southern Cal, we, just, we, we said, you know what, God just wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust his word. He doesn't want you to look at your preacher who's famous, the famous people at your assembly. These are things that I've done on people today. The preacher's famous. Uh, famous people go to their church. Oh, I go to this brother such and such, apostle such and such. And such and such attends this church. Who cares? Who cares about that nonsense? Some people do. He won't, Forget the man. Don't, I'm not the issue. What is that man teaching and preaching? Is it the truth of God's word? God is looking for human vessels to preach his word. Truth. Look at Matthew chapter 10. This is when he sends out his apostles. Uh, go with me to verse 5. Matthew 10, 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of what? Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans. And Samaritans were, 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 were relatives of the Jews. Of the city of Samaritans, enter ye not. But go rather to the who? Lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the gospel of the kingdom they're preaching. Now notice what's associated with the gospel of the kingdom. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. If, if somebody comes preaching a gospel that's not Paul, then, and, or they're saying it's the gospel of the kingdom we're to preach, the Great Commission, they need to raise the dead. They need to be able to raise the dead. I have never seen anyone do that. Freely you have cast out devils. They fake that. Freely you have received, freely give. This is real deal. It confuses people. It keeps people in religious bondage. Time after time, I have saints who, who still struggle with even the issue of their salvation. This is I get this all the time in emails and phone calls, brother wrong, because they've been listening to people who haven't rightly divided the word of truth. This is serious business. God wants people to have rest in Jesus Christ as their Savior, doesn't he? God wants you to understand you have unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. It's not about what you've done or didn't do. A amen, right? Amen. 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 It's all of the Lord Jesus. That's what the preaching of the cross did. Cross did. But let me show you something. When it comes to Israel, because they're under that covenant, that old covenant, until the, the, they're under the Old Testament, the, the, the blessings and cursings, until the kingdom, the New Testament, they're going to have to endure some wrath of Almighty God. They still have wrath coming. The little flock of Israel, the believers, they're going to go through it too. It's going to purify them. Why did Jesus Christ raise people from the dead? Think about something. It's what? a sign. What? It's a sign, but, but what, practically, why did he heal people and raise them from the dead? So that they may go through the, the day of the Lord. Think about that. If they die, they're in paradise, in Abraham's bosom. But if, it, well, if they grew, if they came at this time, he raised them from the dead so that they might go through. There's all these things that Israel has to go through. Interesting. Think about that. Notice here in, in Acts chapter number, uh, we're, we're back in Matthew. Look at Matthew 10, 23. So they're out there amongst the people of Israel sharing Christ. Matthew 10, 23. <clears throat> 
But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily, that means truly, verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of what? Yes. Israel, till the Son of Man become. You see what he's saying there? Before the apostles get out of the cities of Israel, before they get out the regions of Israel, Jesus Christ would have returned. Let me close this chart. Let me show you something. When he said, there will be some standing here who shall not taste of death. You won't die before they see the Son of Man come in his kingdom. Literally, Jesus was saying there are going to be men who he taught during his earthly ministry, had the dispensation of grace not happened. That's a mystery. But had the, had, had the kingdom program continued to operate? Had it, yes. Had it, had yes. It. If it did, if God the Father hadn't intervened, it didn't. it didn't. Some men that he spoke to would have lived throughout have. His, his return. Yes. Not only that, yes. as they're out there in the book of Acts sharing Christ with Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ would have returned before they had even left Israel. That great commission won't be fulfilled into the kingdom. That's why in Acts chapter 10, go to Acts chapter 10, that's why Peter was so confused. That's why Peter, as the Lord lets down the sheep with the, with the unclean animals, and he says, don't call it un, uh, unclean what I clean. That's why Peter fought in gainsaying of going to Gentile, a Gentile named Cornelius. Say that again. Where are we going? Acts chapter 10. Okay. Peter, the head apostle to Israel, is confused because God gave him a vision and he told him to go to talk to a Gentile. It wasn't time. And this verse will change some people's lives. I know a brother in the Lord who was in the church of Christ. He was lost in the church of Christ because they believe water baptism is a requirement, amongst other things, discipleship and so forth, to be saved. And he heard Brother Les Felder teach on this verse. It's an eye-opening verse. And he says, I couldn't believe I heard that man say this. I had to look at the verse. That's why I want you to look at it myself. And he says, when I realized that somebody was saved without ever being water baptized, it, it just blew up my whole, he says, it just blew up my whole understanding of the Bible. Because in Acts chapter 10, Peter is sent, verse 35, but in every, look at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth. Now he's at Cornelius the Gentile's house. And said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respect of persons. Now was that, was that normal for Peter to say that? Or was it normal for Peter to think that the Jews had, had a special uh, place before God? It was normal to think the Jews did, because they did. Right. Right. Verse 35. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness. That's works. Ah, is that's works of righteousness. Right. That's right. <laughs> what does our apostle Paul say? Yes. Titus 3, 5. Not, right. Not by works of righteousness. Now, I, I, I'm going to tell you how crazy people think. I'm, let me tell you how crazy this guy was that I dealt with. I showed a guy that verse. I said, what does Peter say there? Who's accepted of him? Oh, he that worketh righteousness. I took that man to Titus chapter 3, verse 5. You know what Paul says? Not by works of righteousness. Peter and Paul say the exact opposite thing. You know this guy looked at me dead in my eye. He said, no, they really mean the same thing. <laughs> that's, what that, that's what you get. That's what you get. My wife, Krista, I'll show you that verse. Mark, what she's doing. She, she, was, she was confused about this issue of salvation. And uh, she was asking this preacher some Bible study she intended before she met. And, and, and she said, well, you know, Paul says this. Paul says Ephesians 2, not, you know, not a works. And James says, faith without works is dead, James 2. Right. The guy says, oh, they, they mean the same thing. That's what they tell you. Exactly. <laughs> My four-year-old daughter knows those two things. If, if Peter says, and worketh righteousness, and Paul says, not by works of righteousness, how in the world that means the same? But that's the religious shenanigans that they... And, and this James is coming from a preacher. Was, James was written to the Jews. James is an apostle. You know what James' name means? <laughs> it, it's so... Hebrews comes out to Paul. Who is called the Hebrew people? The name James is that New Testament equivalent to him, Jacob. Jacob. Let me see. He's talking to the Hebrews. Who is Jacob? That's Israel. Israel. That's who he's talking to. 
He's not talking about us Gentiles. All of this is, is, is future from, our, our, from Paul. Just nice and conveniently, God in his wisdom puts it right after Paul's epistles, right after the body of Christ goes up to heaven, and then these books go right into effect. Hebrews, James, Peter, all these guys, John, relate to the little flock and the future. <laughs> but here's my point. Not by works of righteousness we have done. Paul says, but Peter, go back to Acts 10.35, they work righteousness, is accepted. And so he goes through preaching about Jesus, his coming to Israel, how they rejected him, how uh, they killed, crucified him, God raised him up. As, as, as soon as he mentioned the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, verse 40, Acts 10, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Now as Cornelius and his family are listening to this, they're believing every word Peter says. Okay? Let me show you what God does. Verse number 41. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, those are the apostles, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people. Who is the people? Israel. That's right. And to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. By the way, that's what the word Lord means. If you guys have been with us, Paul calls the Lord, when you, every time you see that word Lord, comma, the righteous judge. Every time you, you put the Lord on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the righteous judge. Ultimately, that's what he does. He's going to judge all men. All right? He's going to be the judge of the quick and the dead, those who are alive and dead. Verse 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name... Whosoever believeth in him shall receive, not, not forgiveness, but what? Remission. Remission. Remember, that's all Peter knows. It's not until you come up to the uh, ministry of the Apostle Paul that we learn about forgiveness of sins, totally done away with. Remission means, just like cancer, can come back. Now watch this. Verse 44. This is the verse that opened that brother's eyes when let's show And while Peter yet spake these words, Peter is still, he's giving him his, the spill. He's about to say, listen, you better, he's going to say Acts 2.38, what he said earlier. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, while he yet spake these words, who fell down? The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. This is the first time in the gospel of the kingdom dispensation where human beings receive the gift of the Holy Ghost without ever first being water baptized. Because God... God knows. Peter doesn't know. Paul doesn't know. No one knows. But God the Father knows. When he changed that dispensation of grace, he made water baptism obsolete. Because water baptism was just a type and shadow, a picture of the true baptism that we receive when we trust Christ, that Romans 6 identified in Christ. It, water baptism is a, is a picture of his death, burial, resurrection, whereas we get that spiritually when we trust Christ. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. We'll see that in a moment. So, no wonder, look at verse 45. <clears throat> and they of the circumcision, which believe... Now notice, they were what? Astonished. astonished. Why would they be astonished? Peter watched the Holy Ghost fall on Jews. He watched it happen. Because they didn't receive... These Gentiles didn't have to submit to water baptism. That's my point. Keep going. And as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now watch this. Then answered Peter, he's still under the water baptism. Can any man forbid what? Water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Didn't he? Do you understand? You now have on record in the scriptures that people were accepted by God without first being water baptized. Why? Because a chapter earlier, God changed the dispensation to grace, save the Apostle Paul. And I say that, all of that, go back to go back to uh, 1 Corinthians. You can keep your hand in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You've got to put it together like a puzzle. You're just studying. 1 Corinthians 1. No wonder Paul can say in verse 17, for Christ sent me what? Not. Not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 
not with wisdom of words. See, you gotta you gotta do a lot of writing under the well. Water baptism is an outward sign of inward faith. Do you dedicate your life? All this, all this stuff focused on you. When when you give the gospel of Christ, it's all about what our Lord Jesus Christ did as a sacrifice on Calvary's cross for our sins. That's it. He's the focus. Take the focus off of you and what you do or don't do. Put it all on. The gospel of Christ is about him and what he did. The preaching of the cross is about him and what he did at Calvary. We're not there. All God looks for is our faith. Just trust the word. Trust his gospel. Now, let me show you this issue of water baptism. Water baptism, like I said, was a part of Israel's program. Let's look at a few more verses. Just if you, This will be something people can look at. They can have. We'll put this on YouTube. They can keep looking. I want to put the verses out there and compare. Look at Matthew 28. Go to Matthew 28. And I'm going to show you the confusion that my wife even in dealt, uh, endured and dealt with with this one brother. And thankfully, he was open to me showing him. It's funny, I was sitting with the guy, and he goes, that's the mystery. I said, that's the mystery. <laughs> the guy would be reading Paul, I said, what is this mystery? And I asked him, I said, where in Paul's epistles does Paul ever tell you what about time? He thought, he thought. I love to ask preachers that. I was on the phone with this one preacher. I said, he was a preacher of a church that somebody heard us, heard our ministry, and they were so, it was so profound what they heard me saying, they said, you got to talk to my preacher. I said, okay, I can call him. And this guy was a Baptist, and I said, I, first question I asked him, he did his spiel, I said, where in, Apostle, where in the epistles of Paul does he ever command us to word about time? That guy, he, 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 did, he just stayed silent for about, he was thinking. He was thinking, he was thinking. He goes, I don't think he does. I said, he doesn't. And he just paused. I said, he doesn't. And then I, said, I showed him, I said, look at 1 Corinthians 1 17. Christ sent me not to baptize. That dude was like, oh man. Needless to say, I hadn't heard from the guy again. Because <laughs> he's got an agenda, his job, he's a Baptist, he's got, he, I mean, he's got a pension, he's got, I mean, he will lose his position, his status, his 401k, all this stuff that comes along with not willing to suffer now for, for, the, for, the, for the reward then. He has his reward now. There's a dear brother in the Lord, dear brother Charles Stanley, down in Atlanta, Georgia. He's famous. He's on TV. A number of grace believers from Chicago contacted the brother 10, 12 years ago. Remember when it happens. He sees this truth of the rightly divided word. He writes them back. He says, I can't preach and teach this. I'm part of the Southern Baptist Convention. I would lose my position. I lose my church. I lose my my, my retirement. I lose. Yeah, you lose. God well, how about you lose up there, Brother Charles Stanley? Lose down here to gain there. But he's more. He's so famous. He's making so much money, millions. Of, it, his whole life has been his denomination, his Baptist. Well, he's going to lose up there. You don't see that when we go to chapter 3. Look at Matthew 28, the Great Commission, they call it. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. By the way, he was declared to be the Son of God with power. When Jesus Christ did the death of the cross, and God raised him from the dead, at that moment in time, he's the Lord of heaven and earth, okay? God the Father bequeathed that to him. And we're, we're going to represent him in the heavens, the body of Christ. Anyway, verse 19. Go ye, here's the 12. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. <clears throat> Let me ask you, what would the 12 apostles of Israel teach the nations, the Gentiles? The kingdom. The kingdom, but particularly what about the kingdom? The law. The law. Isaiah 2 verse 2 says that the law of God, Lord, is going to go out of Jerusalem and cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. Vast and great. The, the, the thousand years, that millennium, people talk about what that millennium, the millennial is just the first installment of an eternal kingdom on this earth. What The reason why John deciphers a day, because that's how the Jews look at that, uh, Sabbath day, that thousand years a day. But also it's going to take that long for the word of God, the law of the Lord Jesus to, to cover the earth. In our day, it's probably took with, from Paul to the, to the end to be a couple thousand years because of man's infirmity. 
But when the Lord is on that earth, it's going to be half that. It's going to take a thousand years to for everybody to get a testimony. Satan will be, by the way, in our, in our dispensation, Satan is still active. He won't be active there. He and his devils will be in hell where, where God's going to put them. Hell is created for the devil and his angels. And for a thousand years, they'll be down in hell. But the word of God's law, the law of Moses, the Gentiles will be under the law of Moses. That's what they're going to teach. Baptizing them. So they, that's word of baptism. By the way, in the name of what? Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I've had Baptist people who have battled over how to baptize someone. Some people say, well, we're going we're gonna to dip them three times. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Others say, no, no, no. Acts 2.38, Peter says, baptize them in the name of Jesus. It's just one. Some say, nope, we're going to sprinkle. Some say, nope, nope, we're going to pour. Nope, we're going to dunk. They all confuse. It's funny. He tells them to baptize the Gentiles. The Gentiles need to know the Godhead. And the Godhead, here are Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Godhead is made up of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Gentiles will be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Peter in Acts 2 says to Jews to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The Jews had to recognize Jesus as their Messiah, right? The Son of the living God. So they had to identify with him. The Gentiles have to know that the true and living God is a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. So the, if you, the denominations don't seem to have a problem with the different ways. Like it's not that big of a deal that they're going to break fellowship with the other denominations right. unless you say it's not for today. Then all of a sudden, you no, know, that take on baptism right. is unacceptable. Right. They'll have all this other computer. Exactly, Ryan. So yeah, don't we miss Ryan? I would like that. That's how we missed it. But then you're right. They, they don't have all the part. They'll, they'll endure all that. Right. Right. Won't. right. But boy, you better not don't attack the water itself. Right. Which Paul says in Ephesians, what is our, we saw in Ephesians? There's one Lord, one faith. How many baptisms? One. One, one baptism in the body of Christ in this dispensation. Ephesians there's multiple. Other there's other baptisms, other baptisms in Scripture, right. but there's only one. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Right. Jesus Christ baptized them, Israel. The Spirit of God baptizes the believer today into the body of Christ. Different Romans baptizer. Six. Different baptizer, different baptism. Will the baptism uh, come up to the Jews again after we're gone? Yes. The moment the dispensation of grace ends with the resurrection, the rapture, they catch it away. What happens then is they'll be back in the prophetic times again. And word of baptism will be in effect again. Yes. It'll be just like the dispensation of grace didn't happen. Yeah. Look at verse 20 of Matthew 28. Teaching them. So teach the Gentiles. Now, now look, let's no, just no, look no, at the words. No, no, no. Don't teach the Gentiles. That's, that's what the Lord says to his people, to the apostles. Watch this. Exactly. See, Dorothy, you write me the Bible. But in that, in that economy, teaching them, that's the nations, to observe. That's, that's how they talk about the law. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So think about it. They're going to go out with the law and teach, because Jesus taught the law to them, they're going to teach the law to the Gentiles. Go with me, if you will, to Mark 16. This is the passage where the, the brother stopped my wife. She understood that today, she thought she understood that today was, you're saved by God's grace through faith plus nothing. She, called, she knows Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But because she that never was taught by her father or any minister to rightly divide, this brother came with this passage. He wasn't rightly divided either. He says, what about Mark 16? Let's look at it. Verse 15, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now what gospel is that? Is that a gospel of the grace of God? The kingdom. No, because the gospel of the grace of God didn't exist at that time. This is out here. Hadn't happened yet. All right. So it's the gospel of the kingdom. Verse 16. He that believeth shall be saved. Mm -hmm. But he that believeth not. That's why we look at the verses. Did and I skip something? Baptized. And is baptized, baptized shall be saved. So let me ask you this. What if you just believe the gospel of the kingdom? But you said, as far as what about this? Nah, I won't. I don't want that. Nah, mm -hmm. nah, cool. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized. You could believe and not be water baptized, you will not be saved. 
See, water baptism was a part of the gospel of the kingdom. He that believe in and, that means in addition to, is baptized shall be saved. And obviously, if you don't believe, but he that believeth not shall be damned. But don't stop there. Verse 17. <clears throat> and these signs shall follow, not might follow, shall follow them that what? Believe. believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. You know, nobody ever asks, well, why in the world would he bring up serpents? Is the Lord just sitting there and, well, just in case a serpent comes by you? <laughs> no, because the little flock of Israel, because of the persecution of the Antichrist and his henchmen, are going to go into the wilderness, okay? The same thing that happened, like when God brought Egypt, Israel out of Egypt with Moses there in the wilderness and Pharaoh comes, it's going to be, they're going to be traced into, and as they're in the wilderness, what's out there? Talks about verse 18. They shall take up serpents. And if, and, if, and if they drink any deadly thing, what kind of water is out there? There's bitter water, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. What attacked the people of Israel when they rebelled in the book of Numbers? Fiery serpents. There was bitter water. Literally, God had to bring water out of the rock. I, showed, I told you about that split rock. You got to look at that. On the, on the, they don't write the Bible. They're, they're saints. They have a heart for... for, for uh, the truth of God's word, at least in the Old Testament. And from one verse from the Apostle Paul, Mount Sinai in Arabia, they did a whole entire research for Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia and found it. They found Mount Sinai, Mount Horat. Sinai was burnt on top where the Lord's presence was. They found a rock in the middle of nowhere, split, 50, 50 foot rock split in the middle. And you could see where water had ran off. And it was a canal. There was out there places to sacrifice. There was ashes. Interesting, enough room for, you know, millions of people. The people of Israel. Today, they saw that this day. They saw that in our day now. They recorded it. Split Rock is, is the name of the thing. You can go on YouTube. There were serpents out there. There's water issues. There's all types of things going on out there as they're in the wilderness. They got to flee, the Lord said. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay, lay hands on the sick, and they might recover. Shall. They shall recover. Isaiah 33, the inhabitant of that kingdom shall no longer say, I am sick. The fact that sickness even exists in the body of Christ today shows you that we're not in the kingdom dispensation. When the, Paul says to Timothy, you have, you have infirm issues with your stomach, you have gastrointestinal, use some wine, your red wine properties. He says, I know I left Trophimus, that dear brother Trophimus, sick at Miletum. Paul himself, he who had the ability to heal and raise from the dead and so forth, acts, he, he heals with handkerchiefs and aprons. At the, end of his, at the end of his ministry, he couldn't even heal a dear brother. Okay. He himself had the, Luke, the beloved physician to travel. God in his grace allowed Luke to travel with Paul to attend, be his personal physician, because he cared about him. Okay. All these things... Yeah. But I want you to see that the confusion is that is water baptism for today or is it not? And when you rightly divide the word of truth, when Paul says Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And he says in Ephesians 4 or 5, there's only one baptism today. And in 1 Corinthians, go to 1 Corinthians 12. Yeah, Ron, I think that, ahead, that Mark 16, 16 and then Luke 7, 30 just, just fit together and they just fit right point together. that out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They fit right together. And, and, and it's not a difficult concept. What it is, like the guy who, who I read you his email, when you have such religious confusion, that corruption of the religious system, that the satanic policy of evil to destroy the truth of God's grace, in your mind, in your heart, when somebody preaches, the, that guy said the pureness of the word, what he saw, just the pureness of God's grace. It's liberating. It's liberating. But you have to renew your mind. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. When I talked to that preacher and I said, where does Paul command us to water baptize? And I said, even so, he tells us what the one baptism is. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into what? One body. That's Romans 6. It's no water. No water. It's no water anywhere. It's a spiritual baptism. It's something that man, man doesn't put his hands on. 
is something that man cannot see. It's, it's, it's not physical, it's not visible. It's a spiritual dynamic that God himself does. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, that's that one body of Ephesians, whether we be bond or free, your social status doesn't matter if you trust Christ. There were free men, there were bondsmen, and have been made to all made to drink into one spirit. The spirit of God is like this, this, this river of, of, of living waters who places us into Christ. I, I think about that split rock, that those waters come out of there. Moses split that rock. The Lord stood right in front of that rock. He says, when I stand before you before the rock, hit it. Boom. And Moses' stab comes down upon the Lord. His rod comes down upon the Lord and hits that rock. And out of the Lord flow rivers of living water to feed, to, 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 to take care of the thirst of millions of Jews, millions of cattle, right in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the wilderness. Interesting enough, the government of Saudi Arabia has has fenced off that entire area in the middle of nowhere. They don't want anybody to see. They don't want anybody to know. These people snuck in there under cover of darkness under the threat of death. Why would, why would the Saudi Arabians just be in the middle of the desert and they, they block off these acres and acres and acres and acres of miles of land? By the way, there's a graveyard there. What about thousands of headstones in the middle of nowhere? How many people died in that wilderness? 3,000 people died in that wilderness. There's a graveyard out there with headstones, like the Jews. There's rocks out there with, with, with people's feet painted all over it. There's artifacts with Jewish menorahs. Isn't that interesting? The Jews were known way back there. It's the light of the world, even before the days of the Lord Jesus. It's all there. It's fantastic. Go with me, if you will, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So our baptism is a one baptism, a spirit one. That's why Paul says in verse 17, we've got four minutes, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of what? None, None of that. I want you to understand that you can make void <clears throat> the power of, of the cross if you add anything to it. If you add water baptism, if you add anything, Paul talks about it in Galatians, read Galatians 1, we don't have time. If any man preach any other gospel which you have received, let him be what? Accursed. They pervert the gospel of Christ. The purity of the gospel today is how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. The, 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 the issue of the cross, that, that's the focus. However, Paul says it. The blood of Christ, the cross of Christ, his sacrifice, ultimately what that means is it's the preaching of, of the cross work of Christ, the revelation of the mystery, his ultimate humility and sacrifice for us. He paid the price. The Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself before Almighty God. He took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of man. He says, a body has thou prepared, and Father, I will die for man, for sinful man. And what Jesus Christ endured at Calvary wasn't just the beatings of his passion, as Luke says. It wasn't just the physical things that that Roman Catholic, uh, um, what's the guy from down the southern thing, the, the actor, Mel, Mel Gibson, his cat, he showed the Catholicism, you know, look at the beating of him, that was good. But something took place in the soul of the Lord Jesus. He made his soul an offering for sin. God judged his soul to second death. And that's when he said it is finished. That was done. And Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice for you and me. That's Paul's message. It's the preaching of the cross. Notice in verse number 18. <clears throat> for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Who is this? Someone who's lost. If they, have no, no, if they don't want to know the Lord, if they don't seek God, they don't care about the things of God. When you tell them about a person who died on the cross to pay for their sins, probably equivalent today is saying that your savior died in an electric chair in a prison in California or something. You're like, what in the world is that? You mean, because that was the worst form of, of, of death in that Roman Empire. They put those Jews up there and made them a, 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 an example. Thousands of Jews were crucified. That was a very hideous way to die. They just waited for you to lose, you know, lose, con you couldn't breathe. Like, it was horrible to die that way. And that's what happened to our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But to preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Foolishness. But unto us which are saved, now the NIV says being saved. No security in that. Paul's talking about those of us who are saved. It, the preaching of the cross, is the power of God. Everything that God has vested into, into, his, into, his, uh, and into what he's doing today is based upon the cross work of his son. All the power of Almighty God has been vested into Jesus Christ. That's why Paul calls it the word of Christ, the mind of Christ. Everything that God is doing today is centered into the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dorothy, we are talking about your son, Wayne, and how he would ask the, the guy he's listening to at this church, why, why he never gives the gospel. You, you know, you can go and listen to these guys on radio and television, and they won't even hint to the sins. They won't hint to the cross. Just listen to them. Even when they're ending, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I've done it. Talk, tell me about the blood of Christ. Tell me about the cross. Tell me about what he did to Calvary. Tell me that I'm a sinner who needs a Savior, and the way I'm saved is trust Christ. It's always about what I'm going to do, what I have to do. It's all about Christ. And what we're going to see next, next Sunday is the fact that even our lives as believers today, that same power source is this preaching of the cross. It's this mystery of Christ. It's that example of his humility and his sacrifice on the, to the Father. And what Paul is going to say as we look at the Lord Jesus, Philippians 2, that's the power to live today. With that same mind that was in Christ. With that same humility. With that same life of sacrifice. And this is where it starts. If you're listening to this, I pray that you have a desire to know and serve the Lord. To understand what it means to be saved and what it means to be saved. Not just getting to heaven. What does it mean to be saved, set apart unto God? It's that life of living sacrifice. That ultimate humility that the Lord took upon himself. That Paul says is the same mind that we ought to have, Philippians 2. When you do that, that's the power of God to live righteously, soberly in this present world. We'll talk more about that. If you're listening, no one ever loved you enough to ask you if you were to die today. Do you know for sure where you spend eternity? I love you. These saints love you. More importantly, God loves you. He sent the Apostle Paul in Romans 5, verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, still in our sins... Christ died for us. That's the gospel. Christ died for you. Why don't you trust him? If you believe the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, that he, what he did at Calvary is enough to take care of your sin, to make you righteous in the eyes of God the Father, God will save you this moment. Now, no works involved there. The works come in after salvation. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto the works. That work is the work of faith, doing what you're doing now, continue to build up the doctrine as you're doing now. Then get involved in the grace ministry. Every joint supply, as we saw in Ephesians, you got to get the active right where you're at. As much as lie within you, be, be a part with your time, your treasure, your talents to get the grace message out to others. Now, when you do that, people are going to think you're crazy and tell you you're crazy <laughs> and reject you and it. That's why. Because that's the patience of hope, the hope of glory. You want to be a joint heir with Christ that reigns with him. You're going to get to heaven, but you want your full reward at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll help you with that. That comes from patient, continuous, and well-doing as a grace believer. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in Him. We thank you that we can get into your word and study it and look into these things of the preaching of the cross. Father, we look forward to learning more and more as we go through 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2 and 3 and all the way through to chapter 16. We just look forward to the marvels of your grace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for this time together, Father, as we... Uh, have our time of Q&A. We ask you to bless that time too. Um, make these things plain and clear in our hearts and minds. May we uh, have a wonderful time of fellowship, um, able to, to share with one another the cares of this world, but to be comforted by one another in Christ. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.